Hello everybody, I'm your host Wheel Trouble, and welcome to this Nightmare Nights 2017 podcast series. This is the fourth episode where we get to meet the writers. Much like the last episode, I would like to apologize as not all of the writers decided to sit as close to the mic as we would prefer. Again, like the last episode, when I pulled up the volume, the crowd noise came with it. Once again, I've cleaned it up as best I can. Please bear with us. Without further ado, let's meet the writers. Each, if you like, so we can make sure kids get priority. Once you've written out your question on the card, wave it in the air. Someone will come around, collect them, throw them up at me. I will sort through them, assemble them into something resembling an order, and then I will ask them of our wonderful guests, who I will introduce in a moment. Uh, also, uh, in case the announcement hadn't been made, uh, Lauren Faust stayed late for her autograph session to make sure everyone got an autograph that wanted one, so she will not be joining us on this panel. She's gone for a rest, which I think she earned, so... Yeah. It will just be these people, you know. Aww. You know just the next, these people. Do you know what the next panel she'll be attending is, if any? Uh, I believe she has a panel tomorrow. I think she'll be on the artist panel. Huh. Don't quote thought, me on I that. Thought, I thought she was supposed to I leave at the end of the day, but if not, that's the welcome support. I may be mistaken. Well, maybe she could change her mind, too. That's I'm too. honestly not sure. I, uh, the person to ask would be Bob or Sandy, one of the two con chairs. They have the final word on this. If I knew anything, they wouldn't let me talk, so... <laughs> they just won't ask you back next year, that's all. <laughs> I'm banned next year. Yeah. I'm already all banned next year. Unfortunately. Yeah, we all got perma banned. Like, the gimmicks is actually happening, but everyone's in banned. <laughs> it's gonna be empty. Empty Con 2018. So as folks filter in, again, if you want a note card on which to write a question for our writers, go ahead and wave your arm in the air, someone will get you a note card, and then when you have written out your question, just wave your arm in the air again, and the questions will come up to me. So now that we've uh, more or less filled up, we've got some more people filtering in, but I think I will go ahead and introduce our writers. Huge round of applause, please, for Gillian Barrow, Woo! author extraordinaire of the books and also now of several episodes of the show. Yay. Nick Confalone, show writer extraordinaire. Yay. And that guy. Emma <laughs> Larson, ladies and gentlemen. When he's not signing everything and everyone in sight, I think he does some writing. He's like Red Bull. He already signed the panel thing. So how are you all doing? Yeah. We missed the auction. How many people were here for the auction? Like 20 minutes ago. <laughs> all right. So let's kick things off. This is for Larson, but I'm going to open it up to everyone from Chris, and it's a nice place to start. The question is, in fact, how did you get your start as writers? So whoever wants to chime in first, and we'll go from there. They wouldn't have asked if they didn't care, Mitch. Yeah. How did you get your start in writing? Yes. I wrote always. I was lucky. Uh, when, I was sort of playing, when, I was and, um, when I was introduced to a book, I was a kid called Watershed Man by my librarian. I was looking at the rabbits. When I read that, I was like, oh, this is fun. And, um, so I went to school for screenwriting and directing, and I made a couple short films. Can I ask what about that book made you think? Well, I, was too I don't really remember much about it except that. Do you guys know Watership Man? It's the best book in the world. It's very terrible. But it was way above my reading level, and then the guy also makes up words because the rabbits don't know the language. So I didn't understand the part something about it. Speed crack. I read it again. So that, that's what hooked me there. Then I went to school for uh, writing, directing, I directed some short films, and really hated being on set. It was just not my thing. It's awful. It's 
off. It's, it's, if you're ever on a film set, it's really stressful, but nobody's doing anything. You're just kind of standing around doing nothing. But if you feel totally stressed out, it's horrible. Wait, so <laughs> when I was uh, when I was in uh, junior in high school, we got an assignment to write a hero, a paper about a hero's journey, and I chose to write my about the dog piece of the monthly board, his point of view. And I remember when I was writing it, feeling like, oh man, I'm going to fail this for sure. But that kind of nervousness, that kind of hooked me, and then I got an A in my teacher. Like, that totally hooked me. And he's been looking yeah. for your approval. <laughs> 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 I like the anxiety people talk about like when they're writing a paper or whatever. And it's like, why did we choose to do that over and over again? Yeah, yeah. Homework forever. Yes. Homework forever, yeah. Uh, and so then I switched strictly to writing. And when I moved to LA, a friend of mine was an animator at Cartoon Network. And he helped me come up and get into the whole thing. And then I wanted to have my own show, so I started pitching ideas. Yeah. First, first person I ever pitched was oh. Nick. What? <laughs> uh, I met Nick 11 years ago. He was at Disney. And the free eye just came to my unit. And she said, hey, you want to go? So I can catch up. Go for it. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll tie these threads together. So um, I had a similar kind of like junior high high school thing. I was like the kid who would always um, pitch an extra credit assignment. Like, instead of writing a paper, can I just make a movie? And for so some reason, teachers were like, OK. And so I would always borrow my dad's camera and make little movies with toys and like toys on strings or whatever. And then in college, um, I was studying like psychology and pre-med, but then at the same time, I was also like still making movies with my roommates. And I don't have pro, I just kind of like, getting into that. And then right after college, I moved out to LA and I was like, I'll put the med school thing on pause, and I got a terrible, terrible yeah. job as an assistant, which oh. was in live action, producing movies, and it was so many And camp. I got fired from that, but fired to Black Disney, camp. kind of. Like, he was like, why don't you go somewhere where you'll be better students? And I totally got fired, but then the next day, he was like, my boss said, my, this old friend of mine just started a new thing at Disney, and he's an assistant, and I've heard that it's easy, so maybe you can do it. <laughs> 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 Make sure you guys, if you, if you ever get fired, try to get fired to Disney. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was the best time I've ever been fired. Um, and so then, that was that job that I met Mitch on. I was an assistant in the shorts program where they were making like five minute pilots. My book series, Penny Royal Academy, which is the bookstores now, all three <laughs> volumes available for purchase. <laughs> Started out as a cartoon at Disney Channel. With I, I was the first one to buy it. Yeah. Princess Bootcamp? <laughs> Princess Bootcamp was, yeah. I pitched it to Disney, it was going to be a cartoon. So we had Demi Lovato on the line. Yeah. Demi Lovato, she hadn't done a thing, she was still doing a Texas. And then it turned into a Penny Royal Academy, which purchased in the bookstores nationwide. <laughs> So then, I guess for me, so then they shut down that program. So the goal of that program was like, let's make shorts that you guys gotta think outside the box and make stuff that Disney would never do. And then we made all these things and they were like, we don't wanna do this. <laughs> 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 like, and so they fired everybody in that. By, this was like not the good kind of getting fired because I was just regular fired. Yeah, I got fired to just be fired. Um, but it ended up being the best thing because then I was on unemployment and all the people I had met through that pilot making process had all gone on to do other things. And so I ended up getting an, an opportunity to pitch a freelance outline on a show that Mitch was working on. We've worked on a lot of shows together. And then in a twist of events, he pitched to me. No. Uh, <laughs> he pitched Princess Bootcamp to Jillian. Yeah, yeah, and then I wrote Penny Royal Academy.
Dedication. Uh, that's why I'm kind of like punchy right now. I'm like, <laughs> Mitch got up about well, five minutes ago. <laughs> so, outside of Watership Down, which you mentioned, Mitch, um, what are some of the other works or authors that have most influenced your work and your development as professional writers? Uh, I would say, I'm assuming everybody here has, has some interest in writing and some love of writing. Can I get nerdy? Yes. Okay. Get nerdy. Thing, Let's get nerdy thing, in here. Uh, the most instructive thing I've ever read in terms of film is the screenplay for Born Identity. Oh. If you can get your hands on this, you can just give it a little find it. It's the writing and that script is incredible. Tony Gilroy. I would say that too. I would read Tony Gilroy. Tony Gilroy. David Kaplan, so what makes them so? Uh, what makes it so in Born Identity, it impressive? Was time, it was the first time I realized he writes the he writes the timing, and you know he doesn't use full sentences. It'll just be like a gun, dash, dash. Uh, but, but the first thing happens is you picture a gun. Like I heard Brian described as cinematic dictation by Andrew Stanton, who did like Finding Nemo, and he described it as your the movie in your head and you have to be writing down the images you see. If you're not writing in images, you're writing in <laughs> Tony Gilroy would write, because a lot of people write just dense, then this happens, then this happens, then this happens. And you just kind of slow down and get to a paper. <laughs> Tony Gilroy and a lot of other writers, they write pacing and they write they write exactly what you would see. And you feel the, you know, you feel the scene getting faster as you're reading it. Right? But it's literally getting faster as the words are Yeah, sure. there's more white space on the page. That's a good tip. That's a phenomenal screenplay. I think you were asking about like books. 
books, authors, just influences on your work? Um, like that season of The Simpsons with like Monorail. Like, <laughs> that particular era where like everyone would talk about the episode you watched the week before school. Yeah, that year. They influenced his book, yeah. Penny Roll Academy, <laughs> and it's two sequels available from book resellers everywhere. So we've got a two-part question here. Uh, first is, what sort of non-writing experience has helped you to be a better writer? Uh, second, uh, what, if any, sort of formal education has helped you in your writing, or has the formal education about writing never really played into your your work? Stay in school, kids. <laughs> As a model, or? <laughs> Let's remember that we uh, are a nice, all-ages, G-rated convention here. Educational. Weren't you a personal assistant to a I certain... Was personal assistant to a director for three years in New York. Which of us is not? Yeah, I think that's something I've been writing. Every writer I know has that in common. Yeah. Everyone kind of just like eats it for a couple of years working for some awful person. And I feel like that must be essential. I mean, you learn to just suffer all day. I don't know. Like, I mean, one way is it's, one, it's the way you meet a lot of people. And yeah. You're reading all the time. I think that's more important than the formal education part of reading. Finding scripts and reading that. Princeton, and I was like, my parents were so proud. No, it's essential that I'm like letting everyone down by being here instead of as a doctor. <laughs> but it's so, like, you have to write a thesis to graduate, and this was like my first step towards like, I'm gonna go do something weirder and sillier because you know it's like a book a zillion dollars a year, and I was like, sorry, mom and dad, because I wrote my thesis like on meta humor and comedy, like explaining what jokes are, <laughs> and like the thesis advisor was like, I love to read that. There's a section, right, where you explain things becoming not funny. Yes, so I can like get, get one for a second. So yeah, I, I very seriously in like academic writing with like statistical analysis and like R squared and T squared and all this stuff, like break down the joke on the Simpsons where Sideshow Bob steps into a rake and goes like, <laughs> and then turns, steps into another rake. 
Um, I did a study where I asked people like 10 random jokes that had no punchline and put them in a random order, and the effect I saw was that they got funnier till about the third time, then they went down and got less funny, but then they got funnier again and peaked at number seven, and that's the same amount of time that Sideshow Bob steps on the ring. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah. Science. The science of humor. So that's the key to, to doing the joke where something is funny, then not, and then funny again. It's seven times. Go to the seven. Go to seven. Yeah. I, I think it would be going to be sideways, but I don't think it's a follow up study. It's still picking up. Team America, the scene where the puppet gets sick, right? It's like that goes on and on. And on. <laughs> Question here for Mitch. Uh, you've said you're not going to be writing anymore on MLP. Someone is very curious to know if this means that you're now able to read everyone's fan fiction. <laughs> I've been reading them all along. <laughs> More seriously, this is a question from S. Pierce. Uh, very curious to know, uh, when you finish one project and move on, how do you find uh, inspiration in, uh, in terms of what to write next? Or more broadly, where do you find inspiration from? How do you get the words to flow? I think that different lifestyle than good job. You know, like I, at least I don't, really, I don't really go from original thing to original thing so much. When something ends, I frantically scramble and ask, like, who would I know if anything else is working on? <laughs> and then I get inspired by that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. With Pony, I mean, a lot of times we're given log lines that we have to work with, and then you just kind of go from there. Can you explain what that is? A log line? Please. It's just a very short, one or two sentence description of what the episode is going that's what you might kind of see on a TV guide yeah. entry yeah. for an episode. Actually, recently I had something like really weird happen. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. That's good. That's good. And like, and then you're like, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, uh, I wrote a bunch of Equestria Girls summertime shorts, and on the Discovery Family app, they have like original pitches as the log lines that like, <laughs> were like stuff I submitted way before we edited anything. <laughs> Uh, no, nobody asked me to, and I was like, this is really embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> they don't even make sense to the episode. Like, they're just like, oh, this happened. And I'm like, that is not what happened. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, this is weird. So if you want to go look at that and see what it looks like at first, I guess we'll go do that. Um, yeah. uh, Inspiration? Yes. Uh, it's more, I don't know about you guys, but I feel like I have so many ideas already that I'll never be able to do them all. So it's not that I need to think of new ones because I'm done. It's which one do I get to do next? Right. Yeah. And then you end up like putting that on. Like I have been writing for like 10 years, a mm -hmm. bunch of a project, and I write a tiny person, and I have to figure out if there's something else. And I come back to it, and I try to write a little more. And I don't know. I should or probably finish it show right now. It's like yeah. sitting there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're just marinating for a really long time. This is a lovely question from Rob, aged 11. He's curious to know, what is Spike's favorite gem to eat? <laughs> is this not, not been in the show? I think it is. Is there a real answer? I was just going to say the one that's in my own pet canon. Well, it will be official canon the moment you say it. So no, no pressure, no pressure at all. <laughs> How many of you are fans of Steven Universe? <laughs> Have you seen a, a, a wonderful piece of artwork of Pearl shooing Spike away, going, get away from us, you monster! This is coming. <laughs> hmm. Mitch, I know you have addressed this recently, but quite a few people... <laughs> yes, tell us, tell us the truth, Mitch. Address the rumors. Quite a few people are concerned or would like you to clarify your feelings about the fandom in response to the episode fame and misfortune i know you've chatted about this recently at other cons but would you mind kind of blurring things up so first of all if you love the episode fantastic i'm not trying to like uh talk to you about that i was given a premise 
that was very meta, which is not my favorite thing. I know what that did to hundreds of episodes, but it was a special case. So I got this meta premise, which is automatically not my favorite thing, but fine, whatever. It's and then we start going into it, and I just didn't get it. I did not understand why we were making an episode where seven seasons worth of these background photos that we come to know and love were just making the jerks the whole time. It's such a good thing with the frustrated thing sometimes. Like, sometimes on shows, the writers pitch the, the long lines that they're into and excited about, and sometimes you get assigned to them. Yeah. If you don't click with it, it's like, okay. I didn't know how to do it, because I, I kept saying, like, somebody's learning a lesson, and they say, well, the main six are learning the lesson. And I was like, what are they learning? Because they didn't do anything wrong. They they tried to help out by releasing the journals, and people could learn from it. Everybody turned into raging jerks, and then stayed that way till the end. Great lesson. Like, what's the lesson? I didn't, I didn't know what it was. So I tried to turn it into a Pinkie Pie episode where uh, it was exactly how it played out. But then at the end, she gets in front of the whole town and is like, you guys, you are trashing the person who wrote these pages, and that person is me. And it's me. You've known me your whole lives, and you're making me feel awful by trashing me in these pages. And she goes, oh, I'm just totally destroyed. And then it's a wonderful life. You know that movie, The Ponies? The Ponies come in one by one. They come in, and they're like, so sorry, Pinky. You're absolutely right. We, we lost our heads. Um, we love you. And, and, the, and then the moral is the kids, be nice online. You know, there's a real person on the other side of that Facebook message or tweet to yourself, which I thought was a great moral for kids. And then they come back and So then, then you still get to do all this stuff with the, the ponies being jerks, but at the end they realize we were wrong. We shouldn't have acted that way. And that's lovely and heartfelt and whatever. And they're like, that's not that's not that's not what we're doing, so I was like, okay, what do you want me to do? So I wrote the episode, I did write the whole thing. It's all my, I, I keep seeing these things about how it was like some old premise of mine that they, they took and wrote, which is the exact opposite of what happened. <laughs> not my premise, and I did write it. Um, I just don't get it, I still don't get it. I think it's kind of mean spirited, I think it's, um, it's weird to end the episode with all these lovely town ponies just being well, the jerks. Well, it's not do what you pitched. But not do something else. So just be like, yeah. oh, there's something with meaning at heart. Well, we're not going to do that for any of Yeah, so we're just going to leave it where they're all just being. And so it's like, and, and I got people sending me messages like, is this how you feel about us? And I was like, no, this was not my idea. If you want to know how I feel about the fandom, watch Slice of Life and look at the tweets I sent out after that episode. Right? You know, that's where I stand. It's not the same. Unless standing your heart. <laughs> it's a bummer to me that people think that I was like setting out to say, you guys need to back off. It's like that's the opposite of how I feel. Well, there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes that we aren't always allowed to say, but I feel like people. I'm not on the show anymore, so I can say. Want to get really up in our face about it. There are a lot of things that, well, there's a lot of things we get credit for that we didn't do, and a lot of things we get blamed for that we didn't do. not our the bottom line is that you weren't trying to. No. Set, and it wasn't a take that at the fandom. You love them as long as they buy your books. <laughs> yeah, they got that too. That was like that was the big finale. <laughs> they all traipsed over to the bookshop and bought Penny Royal Academy. Right. So yeah. My little pony. Cue the credits. Um, where shall we go from there? Okay, I mean, you mentioned sometimes getting credit for things that you didn't do or getting the blame for things that weren't your fault. Um, Andy would like to know uh, about a time when Hasbro, or I guess anyone really, just when your ideas were pushed back against, when you, you had an idea and it just did not fly. I guess we've just heard one instance where you pushed back and it didn't result in, in a victory for you, but can we hear about a situation where maybe you pushed back and managed to get something in that otherwise wouldn't have gone through? <laughs> well, that's just getting great company with a great company. That's the entire point of the episode, this uh, epic battle. It's, it's crazy that exists. It's insane that it exists. It shouldn't exist because nobody got it. Nobody wanted to do it. Um, it was, the, the emails that went back and forth about that episode are epic. <laughs> um, and nobody got it, nobody understood it. But then they actually, once they did get it, because I finally, after all this back and forth, I sent a kind of a 
massive email to all of Hasbro and all of well, all of the development at DHX. All of Hasbro. All of Hasbro. <laughs> <laughs> like, in the across the world, you're like, listen to me. <laughs> Toy Factor in China is going, what is going on? <laughs> and uh, the hub in DHX was like, here's the idea. You know, this is a special episode. We don't need to worry about what the Masons are doing. They're the background noise this time around. That alone was like, that's crazy. Yeah. The plot, everybody had a real hard time with the plot. They're like, this doesn't make any sense. The plot doesn't matter. The plot doesn't matter at all. The whole point of this is just to see as many background ponies as possible. See what they're doing. Have fun with it. It's just supposed to be crazy fun. That was the whole point. But people were really bogged down by the logistics of the plot. Of this and that. Like, forget about the plot. It doesn't matter. Wasn't there a Game of Thrones reference in another episode that you had to yeah. battle for as well? Yes, and it, yeah, yeah. I won that fight, but maybe I shouldn't have. Forget. <laughs> <it. laughs> <laughs> this is the really, this is the really impassioned email that has because the, you know, Twilight looks up at the sky and sees clouds still just exploded and this gigantic snowball of winter is coming right at him. And I, I was like, you guys, we need to have this joke. This is the only time in the history of television where we can use the winter is coming reference and it's like literally. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that you did. I got oh no, I was talking about the red wedding in season nine. Oh, oh. <laughs> Sorry, we can't talk about that yet. <laughs> but I'll tell you, actually, I'll tell you one where Hasbro was totally right. It was uh, Luna's royal cantaloupe voice. That was that was um, that was a note from Hasbro. We had written an entirely different version of Luna, and they said, "Wouldn't wouldn't wouldn't it make more sense if it was in a different place, just in prison?" Um, so yeah, it was Hasbro. What was she like? She was more like um, the woman from Parks and Rec, uh, Aubrey Plaza, which is funny. Yeah, yeah. 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 Now that's what Mod Pie is, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's a bit more like Mod Pie. But it was a good note. They get good notes. They get good notes. They do. I'm gonna say, Jim Miller isn't in here. You can say what you really think about the notes. In one of your pony books coming up? No, in, 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 in something that is going to be animated. Ah. A pony thing. A pony animated thing with a Breaking Bad reference. Yeah, I think, yeah, I've been having more like the references too, so there's like titanics. There's more references coming up. Do you guys like references? Do you guys like things you know? Beverage farmer members. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Can I ask you a question? Sure. So I, I have a bunch of references in some of my episodes that are like nobody would ever know but me because they're really obscure. Oh, the ones no, no, I don't know if you guys ever do that. The ones with the yeah, there, yeah, there's yeah. references to the movie since 1991. Yeah. Yeah, there's a reference to a paste and honey sauce in the 80s. So like, nobody would ever know about that. I don't know. Yeah. Have you guys ever done this? Like really obscure ones? Oh yeah, of yeah. course. And then yeah. you hope no one notices. <laughs> <laughs> no one notices. Yeah. You want no one to notice until it's going to be. Tell, where are they? Well, I actually, in my book, I used to put like characters and little references to all of the other writers in the book. That's right. Like I made the school that Rarity's assistant goes to, goes to it, which went to Larson's, the new school for design. And it was like, I put one that was like an 80 thing and a 90 thing. I have like a bunch of the writers like it's really obscure because it's actually called stuff. it's called Parsons. Yeah, Parsons. So, so nobody would know that. So it's super obscure. Uh, but anyway, what, what ones do you have? I have so many. It's the most obscure reference that you've made that people have got, and most obscure that people haven't got. I just got that.
<laughs> I had a question in here for you, Nick, and I've gone ahead and lost... Ah, there we are. This is from Michael. <laughs> yes, it's what's... No. We'll come back to that when you've had some time to think about it. But um, Michael was noting that you introduced Starlight to Trixie in Season 6 and to Maud in Season 7. Um, they're curious if... I mean, you can't really talk about future seasons, but you can, you can wink a little bit. <laughs> Will Starlight perhaps be meeting any pony, any pony new in season eight? Um, Maybe, perhaps. Yeah. Um, or you could just talk about how the experience of writing those two introductions. Yeah, I love doing that stuff. I like taking characters and digging deeper into them, I guess. Like, I felt like what was so fun about the Trixie episode just, you know, now they're like best friends on the show and she's there all the time, but that, that started just because when we were in the room breaking the story or coming up with ideas for that season, we were like, so what's Sarah going to do all the time? Like, and so we realized while well, she's starting to become better friend, wouldn't it be funny, like, who's the worst person that would make this? <laughs> <laughs> Basically, it came down to, like, what would make Twilight go bonkers? Like, what, what would she think the worst for a friend would be? And then we were like, oh, that would be so funny, check it out. And it kind of was like a one-off thing, but by getting the opportunity to dig deeper into the character and be like, well, why is she so terrible? <laughs> like, why is she hiding that? Um, I mean, that's what I really like doing, is finding characters who seem really one-dimensional and then dig deeper. Like Maude? <laughs> yeah. Or how like Maude Yeah, like Maude Pye? Yeah, like Maude Pye? Like your character? Like Pye. <laughs> so, the way, you know, tell us. Uh, yeah, uh, when Nick and I first met, we like argued, and then we got into a fight over who got to write a specific episode that neither of us ended up writing. It was the gift of the mud pie who was broken in the room by someone and they weren't there. And I was like, at the end of the thing, it's like, who's going to write in which premise? And I was like, well, I'll do that one. But I think Josh already signed it to you. I was like, oh, yeah, I'd love to do that one. I'm like, oh, I love Pinky, and I, I, I want to write Mon. And he's like, I'm going to do it. And that. I was like, well, no, I, I really am going to do it. <laughs> and then like everyone was like, let's see how everyone laughs, this is what's happening, everyone laughed. And then I was like, no, but like, I really laughed. And then, and then it became really weird, like, it was just being a huge And he like apologized over Twitter to me that night, and I was like, I guess that could help, right? Um, Probably because neither of us got to write that. Yeah, <laughs> They learned an important lesson about friendship that day. <laughs> This is, uh, this is going to straight to his head. Oh, uh, dear. No. Dear Prince Larson. Oh, no. Why was Flash Sentry cut from the Slice of Life episode? Why was what? Why was Flash Sentry cut from the Slice of Life episode? Because he was originally in there. You wrote a little... Can you talk about the little sequence he was in? Flash Sentry was uh, towards the beginning when Frankie was running around town trying to... Frankie to get the wedding right. Flash was tagging along behind him like, don't get it. You know, I come in and wash your car every Saturday and do this for you and that for you. Why don't you like me? Why doesn't anybody like me? Hasbro <laughs> 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 was told that they actually really liked it. Oh. But they were worried it was too much of an inside joke. So that's why he got cut. Oh. This is an inside joke. But they, they left the, the they, were like, they left the button 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 mash on the couch. It's kind of brown. It's also also like wait, because there's so much good coming out. So this is just like flash. Some flashes. Got a couple of questions here as to uh, the best idea that you had that was not accepted into the show, like something that you really fought for that didn't make it through. You do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I said that. I think you've heard this before. I probably said it your last year. How many people haven't heard this answer before? No. Right. Sorry to you guys if you have. We want to hear it again. It was called Philadelphia Ragtime. 
and uh, it was, you know, the map episodes, we did that one season, season five, it was gonna be a map episode where Rarity and Applejack had called the Philadelphia one, the first time we ever saw that place. And it was gonna have this really awesome, jangly piano kind of soundtrack. And the idea is they show up, and they're like, what are we doing here? Why did we get called here? And there was this big crowd, and they go over to the crowd and see what it is, and Flynn has just been elected mayor. <laughs> and his first act, he's saying, I'm gonna outlaw cider from Philadelphia. Oh. And so Applejack becomes a bootlegger. <laughs> sort of like infiltrating the halls of power and kind of <laughs> pretending to be involved with Flam, who is the chief of staff, so that she can get information, and it was, I guess it was two adults. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been the best episode ever. So, yeah. yeah. So basically, yeah, you guys are I got nothing next to that. You broke me. I've got <laughs> Many Fences was one for I wanted to do that since like season two or three, I think season three I pitched it the first time. And just could not get any traction. So then, you know, people, there's always so much resistance to the idea of going back to that group. There's yeah. questions over and over and I don't understand why. I, I'm accepting people. And there's pieces of, of unanswered questions or like mistakes you made, you can address them in the story. And the Folks enjoyed Amending Fences? Oh, yeah. <laughs> It worked out well because, you know, in Bishop and Solano, we wanted to have some kind of a story. Um, <laughs> I, that I have some ideas. <laughs> This is a question for Nick and Gillian um, from The Casual Brony. How do you deal with Larson? <laughs> <laughs> they buy so crazy. Crazy. Except that you will get signed by the end of the... Yeah, yeah. yeah I always like, go home after a convention like bleary-eyed and sharpie all over the <laughs> <laughs> This is actually a... <laughs> also have wings as well, I would assume. This is a question for Larson, but actually for all three of you, but again, I'll preface this by saying this is a family con. What's the weirdest thing you've ever signed? Oh dear. Well, that was you. I keep thinking of things, I'm like, no, that was me. I'm going to say before you say a flip flop. I signed the air. <laughs> a man right here helped me do that. Uh, what was it? What did I have? A light pen. A light pen. And I, I autographed the air. It was like a long exposure or something like that. And I autographed Tabitha's voice. Um, I had a voice, uh, like a, sign, a, a wave pattern of her voice, and I autographed it. And an Olympian. I signed an Olympian here last year. An equestrian Olympian. Yeah. This dude is a gold no medalist horse rider, and I signed him. I have to say, I have a lot of fucking Penny Royal Academy because people think that's really good, and I do too. And we should buy it. So, there we go. My favorite, my absolute favorite was I signed a cop. She. She saw those people that came with cosplay stuff and came up to the photograph and was like, what is going on? And I, I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> I was in my hometown, so maybe I felt like a little confident. I stood up and was like, can I sign you? <laughs> she's kind of gone in the whole thing. And she's like, sure. And walks over and sticks around. It's like a weird hour. Like, <laughs> it's like the weirdest, most useless hour. Like, yeah. It was great. She didn't ask me why. Nothing like that. Sure. Oh, man. Oh, dear. I signed a tweet. That was good, too. That took a lot of work. I photoshopped my signature and 
put it on a transparent background. Tweet, put it on the tweet. Should probably tell you that there was a copy of your last book in the charity auction that was signed by you three times. <laughs> Only it was myself and Dusty and Jim Miller forging your signature. So. <laughs> Sorry about that. Maybe go up in value. <laughs> if you'd like to sign that, I'm sure the person who won it would love a fourth. Um, question here uh, for all three of you um, about sort of different forms of writing that you've done and which you kind of prefer and the difficulties, the intricacies of writing books versus episodes versus academic papers on humour and why seven is the appropriate number. Uh, the worst thing I ever wrote was my very first job was writing jokes for New York Magazine's blog, Vulture, and my job was um, I would take the, the like variety in Hollywood Reporter and the trade and I would have to be up from midnight to one when they would publish tomorrow's news and I would have to write like, you know, Carl Reiner, more like Carl Reimer if he was like we're doing a movie about rappers. It's just like the worst kind of comedy. And it was every night, and I had to do it, and like sometimes I would be like, I think the way don't forget, or I wouldn't be somewhere I could do it, I'd have to go to the library. Wait, we're supposed to talk about the worst writing as well? Oh, just the challenges of the different, the challenges of different writing forms, books versus episodes versus... Because each page is supposed to be about a minute of screen time, right? We covered one aspect of this with the apologize profusely on Twitter, but uh, the question is, what are some tips or stories about uh, working and remotely, uh, working or collaborating with others remotely? Uh, it's weird. 
You guys know how the show works? Yeah. I mean, you're not working in a writer's room breaking it down together necessarily, or you might have one writer's summit and then go off and... So how do you collaborate? How do you keep canon straight? A lot of that falls on the story. Because the individual writers don't know what's going on. Around you, the other episode. The show is so fragmented. The writers are in LA, but even we don't see each other that much. The animators and most of the voice editors are in Canada. Hasbro executives are in LA. Tara Strong's in LA. But none of us, we don't have an office that we go to. It's all very fragmented. Yeah, there's not even a movie. When we broke um, Party Poop in season our, our story breaking meeting was we dragged a whiteboard down into a boiler room where there were like pipes and like yeah. leaking things over. <laughs> like early episodes, I just did over Skype with Megan because I was in New York. Yeah. It's weird. It doesn't the show. It doesn't make any sense if the show works. <laughs> <laughs> it just works. I mean, a lot of that is just amazing story editing. That the, you know, we first looked like, oh, the notes. A lot of times the notes are what we said actually just happened. Lynn, you'd mentioned the difficulty in sort of adapting musical numbers in books uh, at the beginning. A question here uh, specifically pertaining to the finale of season three. Um, how do you handle it when a script is sort of told largely by songs? How involved are you in the lyrics writing process? I know Amy Keating Rogers, when she writes her scripts, includes demos of some of the musical tracks. So how she hears it in her head. But how do you approach writing lyrics or episodes where musical numbers are going to make up the biggest part of the episode. I, I was like hilariously told, like, you know, Liv, we've got you know, this great, but you know, we have professional lyrics, so we don't have to worry about it. So I must be real bad at it. <laughs> I had one an episode in the middle of that started with like a Mary Tyler Moore thing, but like with Ma just being like, like, a lot of still like walking around. Yeah. That is good. That's pretty good. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. I just write lyrics to the song. Like, I'm like Amy, like, I'll write it to a song that I know that has a similar tone, but then I don't actually send it. I don't like it. I, like, I'll write it in that, that beat, with that rhythm. No, I don't actually say, like, what it is. Or at least I haven't. And then I see what they come up with. And it's actually kind of a cool way to do it. Because then it's more collaborative. I mean, stuff still gets changed. I did like uh, the song Dance Magic. I wrote like two and a half years before that episode came out. I mean, I wrote the whole episode before, like two years before it came out. But um, I had a whole like super long beat by rap in that that was much more complex. And it was like calling each person out. And like, and they had like little parts. It, it was pretty cool. Not everyone. But uh, like, I Um, I, yeah, I mean, I used to, I always take an existing song and just rewrite the lyrics, like, uh, I'll fly from that, whatever that show was, the Defying Gravity from Wicked. Ah. Huh. Um, you know that there's a, there's a uh, Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and then, you don't put that in the script, you see what the end of the And it's always amazing, I mean, I have had a good experience, but like, it's crazy because, like, I had in my head a sort of an idea, well, you know, but it's, it's not a song right. So, like, then when you hear the song, it's just, well, like, they're really, really good. I guess the Country Girls one was coming out, too, which actually a couple of them weren't new. I think it was announced already. They're, like, completely different songwriters. So, yeah, they're pretty good. That ties in. Oh, sorry. I guess you were the that ties in with a question that was asked uh, regarding an example of a time when you saw a finished product and you were surprised because it was completely different from the final script you submitted. It's not completely different. Usually tracks pretty closely with what you ended up writing down? Really, really fun to see, you know, the board artists putting so many jokes and climbing 
directly or there's mm-hmm. some stuff that happens on, on, on the DHX end that we don't do. Especially like in a Discord episode, you know, I'll, like a lot of times I'll think like, oh, this could set up something funny or funny or whatever, and then you'll see it and it's like completely out of left field, you know, super surprising. Like in Dungeons and Discords, um, I had written some kind of silly entrance when he comes in, but then when I saw him, they did that like, Space Jam kind of basketball and like, like they'll oh, do yeah. these jokes that, that you know you weren't expecting that though. In, in the one where Pinkie Pie knows there's like a Django Unchained reference in there. That was like a visual thing and I had nothing to do with that and I was like everybody's asking me about it. I was like I haven't even seen that movie. It's like Pinkie Pie has this like cart with like a cupcake on it. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah it's yeah. like this. I don't know. And then there was like a, a thing with like Fluttershy walking by I think we're getting about ready to wrap things up. It started a little bit late, I, I, but I'm not trying to like duck out my restroom. <laughs> <laughs> it's another three hours, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, we started a little bit late. I think we're supposed to end about five minutes ago, but we started a little bit late, so we've run over a little bit. So I think final question. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to have your questions answered, I believe you will have another signing session tomorrow. So they may be able to answer your question then. Um, but I guess advice that you have, uh, or questions that you want to ask the fandom. So words of wisdom to the audience, or questions that you've always really wanted to know about. From the fans, this is your chance. No pressure. Duh, 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 duh. Everyone's saying your favorite episode. One, two, three. All weather friends. Your brief summary. Princess is the dream of electric sheep. That's my favorite episode. Yeah. 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 Yeah.